you work with it with chat gpt and any language model you work with it, with it with a thing called a prompt this is a piece of text that the model is going to use as its starting point to generate a response remember that this tool is all about generating one word and then the next word and then the next word all of these words are going to be formed the way human conversation is formed in full sentences with correct grammar all that kind of thing and the prompt is you're telling the tool where do i start i could generate all manner of text please tell me where to start they can be a question they can be just simply a statement or they can even be incomplete sentences that you're asking the model to complete and this thing can respond based on its training and the patterns it's learned. So it's been trained, i.e. had a bunch of data fed into it. It's been trained on a wide, wide range of subjects and it learns patterns of human language. From the point of view of this language model, because ChatGPT is a, is a language model, right? What does it consider important in that initial text you're gonna give it? That initial prompt that says, hey, I want you to make a bunch of responses for me. I want you to make some text for me. What does it care about receiving? First, the prompt must have clarity. It should be clear and unambiguous. You're trying to make sure that this model understands what your request is, understands what your question is. So you need to be very clear. You need to give it sufficient background information or context to make sure that its responses are accurate and relevant to the area you're working in. If you're working in the area of electrical system design, then the responses it creates are going to be a lot different than if you're working in the area of writing a children's story. That's an example of context, and we'll have a lot more examples of context and how to use this in a few moments. The other thing that's important in a prompt is specificity. You need to be specific about what you're asking or instructing the model to do. It will do what you tell it to, but if you don't tell it what to do, it will assume. And I want to stop here and, and point out something that's it's part of what makes using these chat GPT, of using chat GPT and tools like it, it's part of what makes it a little bit different way of thinking. For years, those of us who've used computers or programmed computers are used to the fact that computers at their basic level cannot embrace ambiguity. You must tell them, for example, the exact action to be taken for any possible event that occurs. And if you do not specify what to do when an exact event occurs, it won't do anything. That's just one of the fundamentals of how a computer works. What's so cool about these tools like ChatGPT is in many ways, it's not restricted in that way. If you aren't specific about what you want, it will come up with something that seems logical and give you that anyway. It won't say, I'm sorry, you need to be more specific. It'll say, well, I've come up with this. I hope it's what you want. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna make effective use of this tool though, you'll tell it exactly what you want. And we'll show you an example of that in a moment. Another thing that's important in a prompt, it needs to be brief. It's gotta have brevity. You do want to provide some context, but you want your prompt to be concise. You don't want to put in a 10-page prompt, right? You don't want to overwhelm the model with a bunch of unnecessary information. Give it what it needs to do its job. And in a moment here, we're going to clarify exactly what those things are, but just give it what it needs and no more. There's a few more. Intent is really important. Even though this is not a human being you're talking to, it does work with the concept of intent. What's the purpose or goal? What are you as the user of the chatbot trying to accomplish? It's different based on your use case. Do you want it to generate text? Do you want it to answer a question? Do you want it to do a specific task? You've got to tell it what you're trying to get it to do. And again, if you don't, it'll assume something, but it might not be what you want it to do. Tone and style matter too. Remember, it's been trained on a huge amount of data from casual conversation to academic papers to lots of computer code, you've got to tell it what kind of tone and style you want the response to be. And they should align with the kind of outcome you want. If you're trying to generate a research paper, it's going to be a lot different tone and style 
than if you're trying to generate a humorous, humorous story, as an example. And so in the prompt, you've got to tell it what kind of tone and style you want. And finally, grammar and syntax. Remember, it's been trained on billions of sentences. And it's learned the actual structure of sentences. And so the prompts you give it should, to the best of your ability, obey standard grammar and syntax. That helps prevent it from misunderstanding you want because it's going to try to match up what you gave it against all of the data it's been trained on. And if the data you give it doesn't obey standard grammar, it'll have a hard time matching it up against what it knows. So let's get to the practical element of this. All that is background. And what we're going to teach you right now is if you're going to write a prompt, if you're going to use ChatGPT to generate you know, text or you know, um, do some work for you, what are the five things that are important in that prompt? Now we're going to explain each one of these in detail. And we're actually going to do a demo of each one of these five things. So you can see what happens when you start to add these into a prompt. But here they are, role, result, intent, context, and constraint. Let's explore each one of those. And this is where we're going to go back and forth from the slides to chat GPT. So what's a role? Let me clarify a couple of terms in here. JavaScript is a computer programming language. Many of the people in this meeting have probably heard of JavaScript. It's a very popular computer programming language. You can use it to write programs in a wide variety of, of, of areas. Node is a very specific tool used by JavaScript computer programmers. And what Node does is it allows you to write computer programs in JavaScript that are not intended to work on web pages. Those of you who've been around the technology industry for a while know that that's a pretty cool thing because for about 20 years, JavaScript was used to write computer programs that would change the behavior of a web page. They would, for example, make you know, dynamic calendars possible where you could select a date or the information you're going to pre be presented with would change based on your user preferences. JavaScript was used for all that kind of customization of web pages. What Node does is it lets you write, write programs in JavaScript that operate outside of the context of your web browser. It's pretty cool. So that's what Node is, right? I also want to explain what direct response copywriter is. Copywriting is the writing of marketing text. Like when you read an ad in the back of a magazine, that's you know, trying to get you to buy something. That's copy is what that's called, right? Or if you're on a web page, a landing page describing uh, the features of some new slippers or whatever you're going to buy, that is copy. Direct response is the practice of writing marketing messages that all in one shot by the person reading them will get them to respond by buying or expressing interest. That's what direct response is. You send the message directly to a person and you are trying to generate a response, whether that's then sending you money, placing an order, asking for more information. That's what direct response copywriting is. Okay, good. So I just want to explain those terms, but you see the concept of a role. You're telling ChatGPT who to pretend to be. And you can get really specific in this. It's very cool. You're going to see some examples. So let's look at result. And then we'll do a demo. Result is what outcome do you want? What are you trying to get ChatGPT to make for you? What's the information you're trying to obtain in your interaction with ChatGPT? That's useful for the module for the, the language model, because ChatGPT has a language model underneath it. And because it tell it can help it provide relevant responses, things that are useful to you. There's two examples here. The first one says, create a controller method. It will parse HTTP request JSON body data to update a record in a MySQL database. Now, let me explain the technical terms in there. When you're writing a computer program, you can make one part of the program be in charge of receiving user interaction and deciding what to do. For example, you could have on the screen an option of viewing the records of a student at the school or creating a new student at the school. Both of those requests might go down to a part of the program called a controller. 
And based on what's being asked, what kind of action you want to have happen, the controller can work with the other elements of the computer program to make that work occur. That's what a controller is. A method is a specific part of a computer language that gets work done. More precisely, a method is a reusable chunk of computer code that can be called upon over and over again as needed to get a specific element of work done. So inside the controller, that part of the program that's responsible for getting certain work done, a method is what does some of the work. Now, parsing means reading through text and separating out the different elements of the text. That's what parsing is. If you were reading through a magazine article and trying to find all the parts of it that refer to, say, archaeology, you would be reading through, scanning, and each thing in there that mentions an archaeology term, you would take note of. That's an example of parsing by a human being. You can teach, you can have computer programs that do the same thing. That's what parsing is. HTTP is, it means hypertext transfer protocol. This is the way that you make requests for web pages and receive web pages. You're in your browser, you're in Chrome or um, you know, Firefox or you know, maybe even Bing if you hate your life. But you're in your web browser and you ask for a web page. The request for that web page is going to be sent off to some distant computer. And then the web page is going to be received from that distant computer. The way to request those is this protocol or agreement called HTTP. When you send one of the requests in to a, to a distant computer for a web page, you are sending a capital R request. So that's what a request is. When you send it in, you might want to give it some additional data. You might want to say, give me a list of all students whose last name starts with S. You would make that request by including what's called a body on the request. The body is extra data. You would format that data in a format called JSON. All JSON is, is a specific agreed upon way to format text. So it can be used by a computer. And that's all this stuff is. So let's move forward. And it says MySQL database. Databases are just stored collections of electronic data. There's lots of technology out there for storing electronic data. One of the most popular is a free tool called MySQL. You can download it on your computer and use it now right? MySQL is just one way to set up a database and be able to work with the data, put data into the database, and then request data from the database. So that first thing in double quotes, create a controller method that will parse HTTP request JSON body data to update a record in a MySQL database just means write some computer code that will receive a request related to uh, data in a database, and it'll actually update the data in the database. That's all that means. I just want to explain some of the technology terms so you're not in a mystery about things. Look at the second one. It's a lot easier to understand. Write a sales letter to be sent to my mailing list. I don't think I need to explain a lot about that one. It's a pretty straightforward thing. But the whole point is, these are both examples of results. What's the outcome you want? What do you want the chat GPT model to spit back out at you? All right, so let's do the demo. There's two demos here. We're gonna do one all the way through and we'll come back and do the other one. So the first demo we're gonna do is the thing on top. I already read it. I already cleared up what all the terms are. We're gonna see what happens when you give this to ChatGPT. And I wanna clarify, all we're giving right now is one of the five elements of a good prompt. We're only giving it the result. None of the other uh, four elements are being given. We're not giving it a role. We're not giving it constraints. We're not, we're not giving it context. We're just saying, here's the result I want. So we're going to do that right now. When you go to ChatGPT, you're going to make a new conversation. It's in the upper left right here. So here I have a new conversation. This down at the bottom is where you enter the prompt. Paste in that prompt. And we're going to hit enter. Now, there's going to be a lot of technical terms here. Just in the interest of time, I can't explain all of them. But what's important here is to see the change in the output as we add more and more things into the prompt. Again, there's going to be a lot of terms here that we're not going to be able to dri drill into deeply. But what's more important is to see the quality of the output. There's a couple things I want to point out. One is that you may notice 
that you may not get exactly the same output I did. Even if you enter in exactly the same prompt, you might not get exactly the same output, which is kind of a weird thing when you're used to using computers. Normally, if you provide the exact same input, you should expect the exact same output. These text generation artificial intelligence tools are not guaranteed to produce the exact same output every time, which is kind of weird. But it's just the nature of it, and you need to know that in using them. It doesn't have the same prediction every single time. Again, we're not going to break into all this code, but I want to point out a couple of things. It looks like we're dealing with changing information about a user, including their name and email. All right, good. Fine. It came up with some code, and I happen to know this code really well. This would all work. What's interesting is this code is written in a program language, programming language called Python. All right. Okay, good. Fine. Now, watch what happens when we add in a role. I'm going to paste this in. What we do not want to do is use this same chat that we have going on with ChatGPT and just add this new information in. We don't want to do that. What I'm trying to illustrate to you here is how much better the outputs get when you include each of these five elements. And if we were just to paste in this new information, in this same conversation we're having, ChatGPT will remember what we did already, and you're not getting a true comparison. Now, in the real world, you would probably include all the right elements in your prompt. But just for learning purposes, new conversation, and we want to get both of those text snippets in here. So first, you're going to paste in the one that says, you are an expert JavaScript developer. This part's important. We want to add more, but you do not want to hit enter right now. You have to hit shift enter a couple of times, which lets you add enters, you know, add a couple lines inside the prompt. Now, and copy that first thing about creating a controller. Copy it and then paste it in. And now before you hit enter, notice what we've done. We have the desired result, but now we've added in a role. You're an expert JavaScript developer with strong node experience. Once you've got that in there, hit enter, and let's see what kind of result we get from it. All right, so let's talk about what's different here. One is a real basic one. This is written in JavaScript. That's the language we wanted. When we didn't specify a language, it just assumed Python, which is equally as popular. But now we have it in the right language. Notice also that it has a little more information, some descriptive information, right? It's telling you exactly what to do in each step, and it's doing a really good job of it. But, oh, and it's got information about connecting to the database, which is nice. But we're still working with uh, just ID and data. Like, it, we, we don't really know, like, it's just that update something in a database, the something has just been assumed. And the something here appears to be something related to maybe a user. We're not really sure. It's very vague. I can't really tell what kind of thing we're keeping track of. Is it a user? Is it a student? Is it a product? I don't know. It's kind of vague. This, this code is usable, but I would have to customize it a lot. So let's find out what we can do to make it better. And now let's talk about intent. Go ahead and read this. Now I'll explain some of the technical terms here. But intent is really like, why are you even doing this? What are you going to use this output for? We've covered what that you want it to make. We've covered who you want the chat GPT to pretend to be. Now we're explaining why. What are we trying to get done here? So we already know about what a controller function is. This ExpressJS API. ExpressJS is a collection of code pre-made for you. A, a, a collection of pre-made computer code. That'll help you build what's called an API. An API means application program interface. And it's just a way for two separate computer programs to talk to each other. So you're using this pre-made code to create a way for other programs to talk to your program. That's all you're building. Why? So that your program can implement what's called CRUD functionality. CRUD? Sounds awful. It isn't. It stands for create, 
read, update, and delete. Those are the four things you can do to something in a database. You can create something new in a database. You can read what's in a database. You can update something that's already in a database, or you can delete something from a database. Create, read, update, delete. So our code is going to provide a way for other programs to communicate with our program. And based on the request, it'll either create, read, update, or delete something in a database. That something will relate to toy manufacturing. So now we have a lot more intent here. So let's see what happens when we put that into our prompt. Same thing. I'm going to copy this in. We want a new conversation. And we will go to the very first one. Go with the expert one. You are an expert. Now grab the result. Paste it in. Hit enter. Maybe make sure shift enter, right? If you forget and you hit enter and it starts, you can just hit the stop button and it'll stop the, the work. And finally, grab that last one I just put in there. Go ahead and run it. So let's look at what we're getting out of this. Well, now we have a step-by-step -step plan. I really like that. Notice here, now we have something that's going to update a toy record. Before, it was very generic. It was update ID and data. Well, that's very vague. Now it's specifically oriented to updating things about a toy. What are the things we might care about on a toy? Well, the name of the toy, the price, the manufacturer. This is a lot more logical. This is very helpful. Okay, good, awesome. So our output is getting more and more valuable because it's more honed into the exact problem we're trying to solve, the exact thing we want. I could follow this and I could put all this code in and I wouldn't have to change very many things. My output is getting better. How do we make it even better? Let's talk about context. Arguably the most important thing. Read this whole thing. This is kind of like the reason you're even doing the work at all. Give me more context. Give me more info about the problem you're trying to solve. So let's look at our example right here in quotes. So we're going to update something in the database. What? Well, it's a product. What are the things we care about with the product? We call them fields. Well, SKU stands for standard, uh, you know, it stands for shopkeeping unit. Many of you have heard this term before. It's a unique identifier for any product that you can sell. Something you can look, you can go to a store and they will, you know, like a retail store and talk about SKUs and they'll know that means a unique product. It's usually a very, very long number. So we care about the SKU, a description of the product, and the unit price. What does it cost per product? Now, another nerdy technical term. The application or program that we're building is going to use a tool called SQLize ORM. It's pre-made code that lets your program interact with the database. That's what this pre-made code is all about. How does your computer program that you're building work with a database? That's what it's for. So, same kind of demo. We'll take this, and now we're going to have four elements, and we're going to build it the same way. But again, give it a brand new conversation. I'm going to copy all of this because I'm going to add that new thing on right at the bottom. Paste all that bad boy in. The caps don't really matter too much. Give me a shift enter. And now I'm going to add in this fourth element that I just put in. The object to be updated is a product. I'm going to put that in. And now I've added a bunch of context. You can see my whole, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Here's my whole prompt. I've given it a role. I've given it a result. Here's my role. I've given it a result. I've given it the, you know, the, the, the intent. And now I've given it some context. Now let's hit enter. All right. Now, again, there's a lot of technology nerdy stuff in here. All I'm trying to illustrate is the quality of the output. And here, what we've done is we've made the output much more appropriate to the exact tools we use and the problem we're trying to solve. We're using a tool called the SQLize ORM. And it shows, so it shows us exactly how to set that up. And now notice we're working with a product, not a toy. Notice we're, looking with, we're working with a description and a unit price and a SKU. The exact things about the product we care about, it's all built in there. We don't have to write that anymore. It's all written for us. Saves us a lot of time. 
And it shows us exactly how to build this controller method all the way through with the exact right thing, SKU description unit price. Now it's even more valuable to me. We're gonna do one last one. And this one again is a bit nerdy. This is constraint. And this is arguably one of the more important things to think with. A condition or limitation placed on the response. You can tell it, you've already told it what you want. Now tell it what you don't want. This is where you would do things like the kind of style of or tone of your writing. Or, as you can see down here, there's a specific thing in the JavaScript language called an arrow function. We do not want to use arrow functions. For whatever reason, let's say at our company, our programming standard is that we don't use arrow functions. Well, you want to make sure that ChatGPT doesn't use them because they're relatively common. And ChatGPT was trained on a bunch of them. You don't want to use them. So you have to put that in. I'll take that. And this is our final demo on this prompt. Copy these four, give myself a brand new conversation, paste it in, hit shift enter a couple times, paste it in at the bottom. And now I've added in a constraint. So let's go to the top. We have a role. Here's the role. We have a result, the controller method. So we had intent right here. Now we have context. And finally, we have a constraint. We don't want arrow functions. Go ahead and hit enter on this bad boy. Those of you who are JavaScript programmers will be able to tell that we don't have arrow functions. Those of you who aren't have to trust me that it's not there. So it's very similar to what we got before. And this is all perfectly usable code. I would have to change very little, if anything, about this, which is pretty cool. Now, let's see if we can go back to the one just before this. See that right there? That's an arrow function. This is the one we just did immediately prior. But now when we go to the one we just did, here's the exact thing, same thing, and we do not have an arrow. It's a minor thing, but it matters in a lot of software development companies. If they don't want to use those, you don't want the pre-made code to have them, or you got to change them all to a different way of doing things. So to review, we have these five elements, role, result, intent, context, and constraint. When I was learning this, and I'll tell you in a moment how I learned it. When I was learning this, I would actually have this up as a list on a separate document or on a second monitor when I was writing my prompts because it reminded me to address each one of these five things. In fact, I was so nerdy about it when I was working this out, I would literally write into the prompt, role, colon, and I would list out what its role was. Result, colon, and I'd list out the result I wanted just to start to reinforce it. I no longer do that now that I'm real comfortable with it, but I often refer to this list when I'm writing a prompt because it's easy to forget all of the nuances. So I hope that's, that's helpful to you. We've got another concept to cover, but this is how to craft a prompt for maximum effectiveness in ChatGPT. The sales letter, you could take this, watch this, this recording, and you could enter these ones in and see what happens, okay? Write a sales letter to be sent to my mailing list. I'm going to do that one, and then we'll do the very last one, just so you can see how much better it can be. So just watch this brand new conversation. I'm going to say, write a sales letter to be sent my link to my mailing list. And the first thing it says is, I kind of need to know a bit more about your product or service. Can you please provide me with this? So I'm going to say, write it anyway. I'm not going to give it any other information. Write it anyway. So all it can do is give me a template. You see how, how this is of limited value because I didn't provide the other four things. All I gave it was the result. I'm not even going to watch the whole thing. It's really generic. You can see it. I hope this message finds you well as a valuable, valued customer. So now let's go all the way. Let's add all of them. Okay. I'm going to say it's a brand new one. I'm going to stop. And we'll add each one of these things in just to illustrate it. New conversation. Here's my result. Write a sales letter. Let me give it a role. Expert direct response copywriter. All right, so there's its role. Let's give it some intent. Let the reader know about the release of a new diet product. Okay, good. Excellent. Put that in there. Now, let's give it some context. This is all this is the diet product. It's called Synergy Crystals. These don't exist. I made this up. I'm a nerd. Paste it in. So now let's give it the last part. Let me give a constraint. Use persuasive language right at a 10th grade level. That's a constraint. Okay, good. Copy that. 
Throw it in. And now, do your magic, ChatGPT. It's a lot better. First of all, it's not a generic template. It's completely oriented around this fictitious product, Synergy Crystals. It's speaking to the benefits of this because I gave it information about that. It's made up some special invitation. Invitation. It's got a call to action. What do you want them to do? Visit our website now. It's also got a PS. Why? Because I put all of this in here. What its role is. What the result is you want. The intent. The context. And some constraints. You get a lot better result out of it. All right, so now let's switch gears. Remember, this tool, ChatGPT, and this is the last thing we're going to go through, okay? It's all about predicting text. We said that even if you give it limited information, it can do a decent job. And as you add more information, it can do a better job. But that doesn't just mean the five elements of the prompt. It can also mean examples of what you want it to do. Let's talk about that. The first thing is a concept called a zero-shot prompt. In natural language processing models, zero-shot prompting is you're giving it a prompt that was not part of the training data, but the model can generate a result you desire. So here's something that was not part of the training data to the model. Why do I know this sentence right here was not part of the training data? Because I made it up. I wrote it. I made the, it. It was not trained on anything. It's just saying, hey, with no further information, Please give me two sentences that describe a landscape with grassy plains and mountains in the distance as the introduction of a fantasy novel. Now, just for fun, so you guys can follow along, I'll paste that one in. Go here and create a new conversation. Paste it in. And without any further information, all right, there's a couple sentences. I kind of like that. Sprawling expanse of emerald gla gra grassy plains, majestic mountains, ancient guardians. Oh, all right, good. I mean, it's all right for fan fiction. Now, can you get better? Yes. You can do a one-shot prompt. One-shot prompting involves providing an example, like a single example in the prompt. It's going to guide the large language model towards the desired generated response. We've given it the same request, but we've said, hey, use the following text as an example. And here's a nice little example. Okay. So, we copy both of these. So we're giving it one example. Remember to do this in a brand new conversation and throw it in. Okay. So now we've given it one example. How can you use this? Well, if you're creating some content and you already have an example of the kind of content you're trying to create, put it right into your prompt. It's not going to copy it word for word. It can understand the entire sentences their structure, the relationship of one sentence to another sentence. It can figure out the intent behind it, the writing style, and it will emulate that style. Finally, you have what's called few shot prompts. This is just the natural logical progression. Provide multiple examples in the prompt. I'm going to show you how complex and valuable this can be. I have a conversation that I had with ChatGPT about a couple months ago. I'm going to show you how it uses examples. And a few more tips and tricks that are a special bonus. Look at this prompt. Here's some things you may not have known about ChatGPT. You can give it variables. I have a variable here called data. It's capitalized. And everything down to here is included in this variable called data. I have another variable called formula. And this is the few shot examples. Every single one of these, and they go below the bottom of the screen, is an example of a headline. There's like 40 or 50 of them. And notice they can themselves have dynamic content. See, it says avatars here. We provided that above here. Notice it says primary goal. We provided that up here. This is how complex it can be. And ChatGPT can understand the format of text data so well that it can use everything up here in formulating examples of headlines down below. And you can see its output. Oh, and by the way, I gave it the five elements of the prompt here. Role, result, intent, context, constraints. 
They're all in here. So this is an example of few shot prompting. You can think of lots of ways probably to use this, but the whole point is we gave it dozens of examples to use in its work. And so the results we get out of it are pretty good. Make money like a Fortune 500 CEO. Got virtual assistant blues. Love it. What everybody should know about. I like these. All right, good. So we're getting towards the end of this, okay? I just want to review. If we go back up here, here's what we got is the basic terms from chatbot to language model, transformer, and what ChatGPT is. And most importantly, this framework for crafting a prompt. If you take nothing else away, write these down, take a screenshot, whatever you want to do, remember this information. It'll help you write better prompts in the future.